All right, guys. Uh, first, thanks everyone for coming. Uh, I'm Felipe. Uh, thanks everyone from Realm for hosting this, uh, for, for an invitation. Uh, really enjoyed. Um, today, uh, I'd like to talk about RxJava and how we adopted it at Airbnb, uh, which is where I work. Um, been there for, for a year, for a little bit more than a year. Now, uh, we have around 15 people on the team, uh, just to give you like a sense of uh, scale. Uh, the company is like growing pretty fast or hiring pretty fast as well, so uh, it's always like uh, a big challenge to, to deal with new technologies, and that's uh, the main reason uh, why I wanted to uh, talk about this. Uh, so first, uh, just want to step back, back and talk about uh, why why this, like why Java? Maybe you don't know what it is, maybe you never used it. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you don't. Actually, uh, how, how many people here have used Eric Java? Just have a sense, okay. That's a, a good number. So, uh, so actually, um, the reason why uh, we decided to adopt it is, uh, we all know uh, mobile engineering is hard, like you need to build very, like, uh, like everything needs to be instant. The user expects uh, instant response to everything, so you cannot like keep them waiting. And um, there's also the, the fact that you need to switch back, back and forth between different threads. There's the main thread, you need to make, make network calls, you need to make all these different uh, things that happens in the background that you cannot block the UI thread. So the reason why RxJava is a good uh, candidate for that is because it makes it really easy to switch back and forth between threads. It makes it like, uh, that is like built into the, the framework, so uh, doing that kind of stuff is, is very easy. And uh, it, like a lot of, I'm sure you have always all, all used uh, async task before and it's very cumbersome and error prone and, and this is like one reason uh, why you don't need to do that anymore and why uh, uh, you can like compose different tasks together, which I'm gonna get at uh, later. Uh, but like the bottom line, the reason why I'm talking about this is like, we make shitty software. Uh, I think, at least I think I do. And uh, I'd like to just talk about that for a second and understand like why, why we, do, we have to have so many bugs. Like, why you have to, you know, have like crash reporting tools that, that, you know, track how many hundreds or thousands of crashes we had or how many users are really mad, like making, like writing really bad reviews about our apps. So uh, there's something must be wrong, right? Uh, in my opinion, we should change something. Uh, and I think that um, imperative programming is not the way we should be doing this. And uh, of course, like ob object-oriented programming has been there for like many years. We've all been doing that. With, that's like built into our core. Uh, everyone like does this with eyes closed. I mean, not, not everyone, but pretty sure I do this, you know. Uh, and but bottom line, I think this is not the way we should be doing uh, software. And I think that, um, so functional programming is the concept behind RxJava, which I'm gonna get into uh, in a second. Uh, and I think that's one way you can achieve like more like solid code that doesn't like keep state around forever and, and, st and code that's more reliable and you know that works, that you feel more comfortable about. Uh, so yeah, but bottom line, we write bad code and mobile engineering is hard. So this is one way of tackling that problem. Uh, so RxJava is part of this uh, ReactiveX kind of group. It's like a group of open source libraries. Uh, and this guy is doing an amazing job. So they have like these libraries in many different uh, languages. So you can see that, you can find that in uh, JavaScript and Groovy and Ruby, Java, C Sharp, blah, blah, blah. So many languages. Uh, and they all share the same concepts, uh, which is uh, they have uh, concepts of functional programming behind it. Uh, it's built into uh, this concept of streams. Uh, so this is like the main concept here. Uh, everything in your code is a stream. Uh, and you have to actually think about it differently. differently. Uh, so the way we think about code today, the way I think at least, is like procedural, right? That's the way you've been doing it. You execute one instruction and then another instruction and then you have a loop and then you call up a method and then you return. Right, that's, that's how we've been doing it. Uh, and then you add to it the fact that you have to do this in different threads, so you have, you have parallelism, so all of a sudden you need to also think about like what happens if this thread comes back and I'm not really doing this anymore, I'm somewhere else. And so you have to all this 
different uh, states that you have to keep around. Uh, so that get, gets really hard uh, when you're doing, uh, especially mobile programming. So, stream, so this concept of streams is like a very like different thing, at least for me it was. Um, I've, been, I've started doing this maybe like six months ago. Uh, that's when we first adopted our, our Java at Airbnb. And uh, it was like very complicated. Like I'm gonna try to talk about my, my personal experience. Uh, first time I looked at it, like I'll get the GitHub page, I don't know what's going on here. You know, it's like so many different concepts, like all this stuff, observables, ob observers, like too much stuff going on. Like I cannot grasp it. And after, you know, really one time, two times, you start to, you know, internalize some of the concepts, then starts to make more sense, right? But the concept behind it, like everything is a stream. That's like the main, the core of it. But bottom line, we, we can all agree that reactive programming is hard. Uh, but it's definitely growing. Uh, I can see like a trend with React Native and React and all these different libraries that are coming up, uh, Rx Java, and also like there's a lot of uh, different tools, for example, Cycle and Elm, like different languages who are like focusing on this. So I, I can definitely see a trend uh, towards that direction. Um, uh, yeah, so however, there are too many concept, concepts to, to, to grasp, and I've tried to list some of those here. Uh, from the top of my head, I was writing some of them. So these are the core two concepts, right? Observable and observer. So those are like the main two classes that you have to know about. But there's also subscriber, and also subscription, and producer, and hot and cold, and back pressure, and scheduler, and subject. You know, and this is not even like 10%. There's like so many different concepts in which you know about, and all this different, you know, log like different, ah, it's like so, too much stuff, I'm overwhelmed. So. You know, I don't know what's going on. I'm confused right now. So that's how I felt uh, a lot of times. And uh, if you guys do feel like that, uh, I can sympathize with you, and that's fine. Uh, just like keep going, keep trying, and uh, eventually things are will make sense. Um, yeah. So uh, after like this is like a quick introduction. Uh, try to like not scare you guys too much, but uh, that's the reality. Uh, and. Why don't you talk about like what what happened to us uh, during this process, um, like things we learned, things uh, that were good, things that were not so great, and yeah, that's like my, pretty, pretty much my, my main focus here. And so first, like I said, uh, we have a team of 15 people, which is a pretty big team. Uh, at least for me, it was my big, the biggest team I worked on ever. Uh, and for every, everyone is working and, and pushing code to the same repo, which is our Android app. Uh, it's one app, so one, one code base, everyone reviews and everyone's code. So it's really important that everyone knows what's going on and, and everyone understands uh, what code you're writing, right? So we use Fabricator for reviewing code and it's like a GitHub pull request, a similar process where everyone goes there, you know, you write a comment, you ask why you're doing this, you think that, I think that you should do this the other way, this is like not, not cool. So you give feedback and all that stuff. Uh, so let's say today you decide to adopt RxJava. You wanna, you think it's cool. You wanna like try it out, and then you, you know, just add dependency, start using it. You know, people on the team are gonna be like, "What's going on? I don't know. I don't. I don't know what you're doing." You know, it's like this is like different language to me. I, I don't. I, I just cannot grasp it. And if you don't know what's going on, it's really hard to to, to understand what's going on behind the scenes. Uh, so it's really. It, so that's one thing I learned is really important to get everyone on the, on the same page, you know, getting everyone on board. So if you have a big team, you know, maybe if you're like just two people, it's fine, or you and another guy, you know, just talk about it, and yeah, let's do it. But when you have more team, it's really hard to get everyone on the same page and everyone understanding what's going on. Uh, like I said before also, learning curve is very steep. Uh, there's uh, too many things to, to understand and it's very overwhelming. So you often make silly mistakes, you know, we're gonna, write code that makes no sense, you're gonna crash in production. Uh, but eventually, it's gonna be fine. Uh, so my experience has been at least two to three months to get uh, everyone understanding it. So I'd recommend, you know, talking about it as a, as a group, you know, trying to explain these concepts uh, to the rest of the team if you're planning to, to adopt uh, this, this, this technology. So yeah, so try to get a good grasp of it. Once you're feeling confident, you know, get everyone in the same room and talk about it and try to explain what's going on, get hands on, you know, open, open Android Studio and try to demo some code. That's, that, 
you know, that helps a lot. Um, also, debugging is like a really, really big problem. Uh, that's uh, every, everyone, like everyone in the community knows that, and they know that's like something that needs to be fixed. Uh, and once you actually give an ex special like attention to that detail, uh, this is like one stack trace we ha I got like two days ago from our bug tracking uh, uh, system. So this is like. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, I don't know how many interceptions we have. So it's like, it's coming from Rx Java and it's like unreadable, right? You just, it's just like a massive amount of stuff. And if you zoom in to one of the actual like interceptions, you just see a lot of noise, right? Rx observers, internal operators, replay subject, blah, blah, blah. You know, it's like, I don't know what's going on. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so this is a big problem, and this is like, uh, I don't know if anyone is actually, is, is actively uh, working on fixing this, but if there's any startups that, sh that you know, are focusing on something or looking for something to focus and they want to like work with technology, here's something you could like try to fix, you know? There's giant stack traces that no one can read. So uh, the only useful part of it is like the third line there where we have like, our batch request observer on error. That's like the only part of a uh, piece of useful information I find here. So yeah, sounds like it could be improved. Uh, so common pitfalls. Uh, I wanted to point uh, some of these points that uh, that I believe were like blockers for us, and and like caused a lot of trouble for us while adopting RxJava. So first one, observe on right. Uh, if you haven't heard about it, you probably should look into it if you're like planning to work with Rx Java. It's like a very core and important concept. Um, and why don't you bring a one piece of code as an example of uh, like what could be what of how it's used. So this is actually uh, one piece of code that we have in our app, and we're using. We're like building a stream of Rx Java. Uh, it's an observable stream, and we're calling observe on twice here, uh, which make may make no sense. So, does anyone know what's going on here? Can anyone, if you used before uh, Rx Java before, you know, I, I mean, can you, anyone, anyone would like to to suggest what's going on here? I, I assume, please, you, you want to chip in? Yeah, go ahead. So effectively here, you can think of it as every time you call observe on, everything after that point is going to be running on that scheduler. Right. And what if you call it again, like later on? <clears throat> then it switches it again? Yeah, yeah. That, that's pretty accurate. Yeah, so that's, that's exactly it, right? So uh, when you're using RxJava, you're building a stream, right? So this is like a giant stream that you're building. Uh, and whenever you call observe on, you're actually switching threads. So that, so one common misconception about RxJava is that it's like asynchronous, right? I'm just gonna be, use this observable and it's gonna be asynchronous, it's gonna like use the right thread for me automatically and that's not how it works, right? So everything is synchronous by default actually. And whenever you build a stream, you're actually, uh, you're, you're actually, con so here you're actually just constructing it uh, to the point where you actually subscribe to it. So when you subscribe is when you, when you build it all together, and then you, exe you actually execute it. So until you call subscribe, you're only like building, you're like constructing a stream. You're like, it's like a declaration process. And whenever you say observe on, you're switching to a different thread. Uh, so what's going on uh, when, before, so if you don't call observe on, everything is gonna run the same thread that subscribe to the observable. So for example, here we have subscribe. So if this is called from the main thread, everything is happening in the main thread, regardless of what you're doing, everything is the same as synchronous. Right? So it's gonna block and that's it. So observe on is, is, is a way of saying, hey, I want this from now on, I want this to happen in a different thread. So you're, you're effectively moving all the offloading that work to a different thread and that's gonna make it asynchronous. Uh, so what's happening is, so the first time we call observe on, we're passing a scheduler. Uh, so you can think of a scheduler of like a, it's like a abstraction on top of an executor service where you can, it's like a thread pool where you can send a work into and then it's just gonna queue it up and do it later. 
so it has a few of these schedulers built in, uh, and one of them is the I.O. scheduler. And uh, this I.O. scheduler uh, is going to do, of course, work on the I.O. thread, which is a thread pool that's bound to I.O. Uh, so what's going to happen is the map and the flat map operators are going to be executed in that thread. And then whenever that's finished, we send it back to the main thread. Right, so you're doing, doing work on the main thread, assuming this is called from the main thread. You do some stuff on the main thread, offload it to the background, and then move it back to the main thread. Uh, so if you didn't use RxJava, this would be like a pretty complicated thing to do. Uh, and so this is, is like a very simple and short declarative way of, of saying what you want to do. And, and that's one of the reasons why it's so complicated, because it's like a very short amount of code, but it takes a long time to actually understand what's going on in there. Um, also, I'm, I'm not assuming everyone knows what map and flat map does, but I just, uh, we can look into that later, but I just assume that, uh, just don't worry about that for now, it's just like transforming a stream. So all we're doing that is, well, all we're doing is transforming the stream over and over again until the point that we're ready to, to sh use that for displaying on the UI or something. Uh, Another concept that uh, usually comes tied and w tied with observe on, which is uh, because they are like very tied together, is like subscribe on, and that's that's also a very tricky operator that I just recently learned what it does. I mean, not really learned what it does, but learned what exactly how it works, which is uh, regardless of where you call it. Uh, it's always going to change the thread where this, the observer is created. Sorry, where the, the thread or the observable is subscribed to, which is pretty complicated if you don't know uh, the, the terms. So uh, I'll try to be more descriptive, descriptive than that. So the first call there is observable factory that you observable, right? So that's doing something which we don't know here what it is. Uh, and that's like, that's like, when, so that's where the observable object is created, uh, and that, uh, that's exactly the piece of code that's affected by subscribe on. So when you subscribe to, the, to, this, to this stream, so there's the code that runs upon subscription, right? So you have the code that runs uh, when you subscribe to it, and then you have all the other operators, all, all the other mutations that you have on that, on that stream. And so this changes which thread is it, uh, where where the subscription code runs into, not the rest. So it doesn't matter where, f when you call it, you could call it from the top or from the bottom, it doesn't matter. It only changes the thread where the subscription is, is, is executed. Uh, I'll get into that later, maybe, uh, if I think it's like a pretty complicated uh, concept. Uh, so I wanted to, to talk about that l uh, more later. Uh, another item, uh, Area that's really complicated as well as error, error handling. Um, that's not trivial either, uh, like everything else, of course. And uh, do one error is one way of, of of doing error handling. So we use it, for example, for for uh, logging or error. So, for example, if something goes wrong, let's say your network network failed, your your response was 500 servers down or something. You want to maybe log that to your analytics service, and then you wanna, like track that event. Let's say you want to say, you know, want to know how many times that happened or something. So do an error is actually on is, is an is an action that's executed whenever uh, you get an error in the stream, and and then you can have of course multiple of those, so you can do m multiple uh, error handlings for for one thread for one stream. So whenever you call do an error. Uh, when, when it sees an error event, it's going to call that action, but it's not going to change anything, right? It's just like a side effect that's, ha that's, uh, that's happening. Um, another construct that can be used is on error resume next, which works kind of like a catch block, uh, which is something that doesn't make sense at all, right, on, on the reactive world. But uh, if you think of a way of like catching, how, how can I catch a, a pro an error, an exception? So that's one way you would, you would handle an exception. It's like you, you say, you're saying, hey, whenever I see an error, I want you to actually uh, run this action here, which is going to just catch that error and, and keep going, right? And then maybe wrap that exception, log it, and, and maybe return an empty data set or something. 
So that's, it works, if you think like imperatively, it works kind of like a catch, catch block. Uh, yeah, so that's pretty much it. I hope it makes sense. Um, another thing, unit testing, right? Um, it sounds like a pretty complicated thing to test a synchronous stream of data, like which I don't know where it's gonna run, when exactly. So ArcJava comes with this nice uh, class called test subscriber. So this is a, a test class that you can use to subscribe to your stream and then you can block on, into it uh, and wait until you get an event. So it has these handy methods, for example, a wait terminal event is gonna block the thread until it gets uh, a terminal event. So a terminal event is either uncompleted or on error, right? So uh, if you're not familiar with the observable of the, sorry, with the reactive contract, which is how they call it, so you get like a stream of events, you get a next event. So for every event in your stream, you got a next, a next, a next, for z up, from zero to n times. And then whenever it finishes, you get uncompleted. Or if it fails, you get an error. And after that happens, you cannot get any event anymore. So that ends the stream. Um, so a terminal event would be, if I'm not mistaken, if it's like just uncompleted, so it's gonna wait up to, in this case, it's gonna wait up to three seconds until it sees an uncompleted uh, event. And then it's gonna uh, get on error events uh, in, the, in this line here. So you can actually look into the exception and see what's going on. And then assert that, it, the, that the right exception class is being used. For example, that's what we're doing here. But you could like tap into the stream also and see what's going on. Um, Another thing that you can use is to blocking. Uh, that's that's effectively gonna block the thread. Uh, so you can use that to, it's very handy on, on unit testing. It's not as useful on production code, of course. You don't wanna, if you're using RxJava, you're not, likely not the one to block your, your thread, but <coughs> it comes really handy when testing. Uh, it's a little shorter than, than using a test subscriber. If you know it's gonna, not gonna fail, you can just block and get the first event. And then in this case, we're just gonna get the run that request, get the, 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 the request uh, that the server got. In this case, we're using uh, OKHTP where you can actually, we can mock the response and then send a fake response back. And we're adding a header there and testing for, this was a bug on OKHTP that we're testing for, for like uh, special characters on, on, on headers. So we're just testing if we cleaned up the header correctly. Um, another problem, memory leaks. We all know about it. If you do mobile, you, you, you know about out of memory exceptions. I'm sure you guys all have a pretty big list of out of memory exceptions in your bug tracking. Um, <clears throat> so whenever you subscribe to a stream, you get a subscription back, right? Uh, and you can, uh, once you get a subscription, you can unsubscribe to it. So once you subscribe to it, you you free really you literally free resources. You, you like you not don't have a reference to the to that stream anymore, uh, and that's you know we all know that's important when when like making requests for for example from a from a, an Android activity or a fragment. You don't want to like just fire and forget, right? You want to actually clean the resources that are located when when the activity is destroyed, for example, which is a pretty common pattern. So one thing you can use is compo composite subscription, which is a, a class that can group different uh, multiple subscriptions together. And then uh, you just uh, add the subscription to, to it. And then whenever you destroy the activity, you just clear it out and, and that's it. Um, additional resources. Uh, this talk is like a very sh short for the, the amount of, of, of stuff that, it, that we could talk about. But it's, it's, I kind of modeled it after a, a longer, like a one hour talk from, from this guy, which is like my, kind of my, my reactive hero. So if you're interested in this topic, definitely watch this talk. Uh, it's like a one hour long talk where he goes like much deeper into these topics and like help me understand a lot of this stuff. Uh, so definitely recommend watch this talk. Like everything that I talked here, he talks about it and talks even more in depth and explains me much better than I do, of course. So yeah, just watch it. Uh, I'm gonna open up for questions right now. Um, I don't know what you guys wanted to know about questions, like anything, anything goes, so. Hey, uh, what's your strategy for retrying when you do get an error? When you get an error? Yeah. 
Um, like for example, for a network request to your server to go get data. So in our case specifically, we don't, we don't really retry requests. Uh, we just fail and, and that's it. Uh, but uh, if you want to do that, one way of doing that would be with on error resume next. You could you know, resume to another request and then you could do that like multiple times. Maybe like if you get a one error, resume to a different request. And then maybe you can do it twice to retry it two times if you want. Uh, but yeah, so one, yeah, that, that's one way of doing that. I never really implemented that with RxJava, so I don't, I don't know like a specific idiom you could use. But I would definitely recommend, uh, no, yeah, using that on error resume next. But also, uh, like on that same topic, uh, I'd like to talk about like how on error is like very, uh, you know, um, toxic and the, and the way that it ends your stream. So it's like a, just wanted to talk about like, Mention the fact that it's like very, really uh, important to handle errors correctly, otherwise your stream is destroyed. So, uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, so, bottom line is I don't have a good answer. <laughs> okay, thanks. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, in Java eight, lambdas don't necessarily carry a reference to the context in which they were. Um, <clears throat> Uh, created, but uh, in Android, I believe they do. Uh, or, I mean, Android hasn't really implemented Android 8, I mean, Java 8. So, you know, I saw that you had a method reference there, and I'm, I'm a long-time Java programmer, kind of new Android programmer. So um, I'm curious about, uh, like, what is your uh, experience with, you know, um, memory leaks regarding, you know, holding references back. Right. Uh, yeah. So we, we, we didn't really have any issues with lambdas as far as I could tell regarding memory management. Uh, actually, it was pretty surprising. So we use a tool called Retro Lambda, which backports Java 8 lambdas into Java, in the, to Java 7 bytecode because Android doesn't support Java 8 natively. So you have to, it's like a hack that, you know, changes bytecode into something that Java 7, it's, it's compatible with Java 7. And uh, yeah, we didn't really have any issues with that. We use that pretty extensively, extensively, and it like makes like if it makes like working with Rarex Java much much better. And uh, I haven't seen any issues. Uh, it's actually a good point. I, I like our code has, seems to be fine in regarding to to lambdas. So the only things that that we really need to be worried about is like the actual subscription. You know, clearing that when you destroy the the activity. Uh, but doing that, we, we seems, to, seems to be working fine. Yeah, we haven't seen any other problems. So, so that method reference that you showed, was that actually in, in Android Studio uh, using Retro Lambda? Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, so I don't know if you followed the Rx Java repo um, too often, but basically Ben Christensen left back in October to go work for Facebook. And since then, the project has kind of taken a steep drop off. Um, it's kind of being maintained by one guy right now. Um, do you have any concerns about kind of like the long-term viability of, you know, basing your development around this framework? Right, uh, that's a good question. Um, that's definitely true. Uh, so as far as I heard, uh, Netflix was kind of committed to allocate people to work on this. That doesn't seem to be happening yet, uh, in the sense that yeah, like David David Carnock is this guy who's been maintaining the project kind of alone. I mean, the guy is like really really smart and takes like everything <laughs> on on his back. So he and and the thing is, uh, Arc Java One Zero is really really stable, uh, and it's like I don't I don't think w uh, I'm worried about like uh, future bug fixes or security or anything like. Uh, it should be like good for years to come. Regarding like future development, like two zero, that's kind of like an unknown because you know they wanted to use our uh, Java eight as far as you could tell, but yeah, it's not compatible with Android, and they wanted to do a backport with Java seven. So, so two zero is kind of like an unknown. We don't really know what's going what's going to happen, but uh, I'm pretty like comfortable with one zero since it's like pretty stable. You know, it's not going to change much anymore. Uh, what's there is there, but if for the future, yeah, I'm definitely kind of worried, yeah. 
Um, some good news on that front is uh, David actually backported all of 2.x to Java 6. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I saw that. That's pretty amazing. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> could you elaborate on techniques for splitting streams? There's a lot of there's a lot of material on combining streams, but the only technique I've really found for splitting would be like the publish connect model, and I feel like that's often probably better suited for uh, adding multiple subscriptions rather than splitting the observable into multiple observable streams. Right. So the only thing we used for, uh, on that on that front is like I've used share before, which is one way of can have like one sub, one observable being subscribed by multiple people, like you said. I can't remember exactly the difference between share and publish and connect. I, I think they're basically the same thing. Yeah, yeah. right. So that, yeah, we've, we've used that for allowing multiple people to subscribe to the same observable. But uh, I don't really know how, like other ways we could do that. So one way of splitting, not actually splitting a, f uh, a stream, but when you do like, for example, flat map or, you know, concat map, you're actually getting a stream and building that. Inch. That's actually more like com combining, right? Yeah, I can think of other ways actually of splitting. Do you have any like uh, examples of where uh, we would need, need yes. that? Yes, well, the, so the use case I have is, let's say I have an initialization st event stream that sort of it basically finish, sorry, it finishes initializing a, something. And then at that point, maybe a bunch of models need to be populated. Um, and let's say, so each of these model streams is going to be triggered by one initialization stream. Mm -hmm. um, so right now, I basically just have been publishing the initialization stream and then each of those can get um, connected to the corresponding model streams. Uh, I see. But I don't see, it feels like a hack. Uh, I, I don't see. think that's really what it's intended for. I'm not sure. Yeah, it's a good question. I don't really know. <laughs> you, mentioned, uh, you mentioned in your talk that one of the difficulties was hot versus cold observables. Do you have documentation or naming conventions in your code to try and make clear whether an observable, like, oh, surprise, you subscribe and there are side effects? Or, uh, or I would, actually, I wouldn't say that's one of the difficulties. It's just like one more concept that you have to grasp. Uh, we didn't really have that problem because most of our usage of RxJava was around a retrofit, which is like pretty straightforward, right? You subscribe to it and make us a, a network request. Uh, and we we're actually we're talking about this even uh, right before the, meet, the, the meetup. And, and that's like a cold observable, but uh, the, the concept is like really confusing sometimes. I have also have the concept of warm observables, right? And it's, it's pretty like, it's, it's pretty confusing sometimes. It's, yeah, uh, I haven't really had much problem with that since I haven't like touched that much, but uh, yeah. Uh, the RxJava repo has a really good wiki. They have like great like documentation. Also the, the ReactiveX website has a lot of stuff. But yeah, definitely there could be a lot more documentation on that. Uh, I definitely feel like we should, we definitely need more stuff. And uh, yeah, so the main, main, my main points of searching are the website and the wiki. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Hey, can you talk about some of the challenges you like Airbnb faced? Because there was clearly like a period when you decided, hey, let's go with RxJava, right? So like you decided to migrate a whole bunch of things to your repository. Can you talk about some of those challenges? Like what was difficult? Like was it all just people problems? Like was it just people didn't understand how to get trained quickly in using RxJava or was it something else? Like can you talk a little more? Yeah, I would say it was mostly uh, a people problem uh, and people including myself, right? Because I was actually also learning. And so you have a problem where you are learning a tool and you want to like introduce that to your team of people who also don't know about that tool. So when you're trying to explain that to them, you're actually having a hard time because you don't really know how to explain stuff. And you know that's awesome, it kind of makes some sense in your head. But when you're gonna explain, even for me today, it's hard to explain some of the concepts, right? Because they're so complicated. Uh, so I would say that was the most, the, the biggest challenge, uh, in my opinion, was like getting everyone up to speed. We didn't have as much like, of, uh, like uh, production issues. We had, of course, a few crashes, you know, here and there of just like uh, naive usage of, you know, not, can't remember exactly, but yes, uh, we had a few of the, that, that, that stack trace was an example, but it was definitely not the main problem we had. So we had like an, 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 a legacy setup we're using Volley for our network, and then we switched to Retrofit. 
And then we have like the, all this, a lot of legacy code around that with uh, request classes. And it doesn't really fit the way Retrofit works. So we actually had to fork Retrofit to make it work with our current setup. And, and then it was just a matter of like adding an observable uh, facade on top of it in a way that you can subscribe to something and then it just fires off and you forget. So the, most of the work was just like building this facade, like this, you know, this interface on top of uh, Retrofit that would like make it work for us. And then we're just like building on top of it. And, and, and once we got this basic setup in place, it works perfectly. You know, we just don't have any problems. Uh, but here and there, there's a few, you know, challenges. But I would say most of the challenges around learning, actually, you know, getting everyone to understand it, uh, because it just takes time. You know, you just you just cannot skip that. Yeah. Uh, so you mentioned it, you know, uh, ArcJava is really hard to take on. There's a lot of issues logging uh, stack traces and stuff. Now looking back uh, and seeing that you migrated over, do you think it was worth the trade-off for the pros you've mentioned before? Uh, one, and then two, do you use uh, ArcJava for everything or do you have like a line you draw on where you want to use ArcJava here because this is complicated in terms of asynchronous task and then this stuff, it's just normal callbacks because we don't really care for this, it's simpler. Like is there a line you guys like draw there? Yeah, that's a great question. So for your first question, yes, uh, I would think it's, it's worth uh, the, the, the investment. It's, 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 a big, it's a big investment to take, of course. You know, we're going to spend a lot of time learning. And, and uh, I think it's definitely worth it, uh, especially if you're like, uh, so once you, so you get more benefit once you start to use it more. You know, once you start to combine streams and, and mutate them, and you're gonna, you're gonna actually look at this and look, hey, I'm accomplishing a lot of stuff with this much code, you know? You have this little, you know, piece of code that does wonders for you, and that's really amazing once you reach that point. Uh, also, like, if you're doing, like, server, like, backend is also useful, you know, for requests, uh, you can, like, do wonders with that. If you watch the talk that I mentioned from Ben, he goes deeper into that. They, they actually achieved a lot of stuff uh, using that, they actually, you know, got the response time down and stuff like that. So I definitely think it was, it was worth the price. Uh, regarding where to use it, we're only using it uh, around our network layer. We're not even uh, exposing that to the UI because that's like a much bigger, you know, uh, bet. And, uh, and that's where the team, uh, you know, getting everyone on board and knowledge thing gets into play because if you expose that to the, your, your, your UI, to your activity layer, your views, then it means that like, everyone literally has to understand it to use, right? Whereas in the network layer, it's pretty much me and two, one or two other people who are touching it, you know? So we don't have to have everyone understand what's going in there. We just then expose an API, and then it just works for them, right? And then it's like, there's like a bridge where we use our, uh, Java here, and then over there, we, it's like normal land, you know? So we don't expose it everywhere. It's like kind of limited use. Even though it's like a core part of our app, it's like a very special part of it. It's not everywhere. Yeah. Okay. Uh, on that note, uh, do you guys does does your UI layer have a, like do they understand main main schedule at all? Then do you guys let them know what no. schedule? Oh, so it just comes. No, the just UI calls. layer doesn't know about any of that. They 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 just like have listeners, which is like a, a shim on, on on top of Observer. And they all they care about is a callback, right? So they make a request and get a callback that back. That's it, and they don't know what's going on there. Yeah, you're welcome. So on that note, <laughs> I have a question: like, how do you handle the the activity recreation uh, in case if they just listen for listener? How do you handle this? Whole yeah, thing? so we actually ended ended up building a library for that. Uh, so there's a few. <laughs> There's a few options around, uh, on the internet. I think Trello built one library for that, but we, we ended up building our own custom logic. So we, it's actually open source if you want to look it up. So it's called Rx Groups, where we group requests together and we, we actually unsubscribe them uh, together when you destroy the activity. So the main gist is like we tie it up to the activity lifecycle. So when we create, we create this, this group and then we add uh, subscribers to it. Whenever the activity is destroyed, we clear it out. And it's also a proxy uh, in the sense that, for example, let's say you're rotating the activity, we know that you're coming back there. So it's destroying and recreating, but we, you don't want to cancel the requests, right? But uh, what Retrofit does is like it, it, it cancels the request once you subscribe. So we have like a subject in the middle, like a replace subject, 
that kind of just, uh, if it gets a response from the server, it just replays instantly when you come back. So that's, uh, that's all in this library if you want to take a look. Okay, thank you. <laughs> that sounds pretty complicated. Yeah, it's, it's kind of tricky. <laughs> I think we're probably out of time already, right? Yeah. Okay, thanks everyone. Thank